<laughs> well, the phone rang about 4.30 that afternoon, and I saw my sister's name pop up on the screen, and I was really anxious to talk with her because she and her husband had just moved to Roanoke, Virginia earlier that summer. It was the closest that we had ever been, and as sisters who were really close, we had enjoyed every moment. We spent time going out to Farmville and out to Petersburg. We explored every single place that we could find that lay between us. We just wanted to be in each other's company. But during that time, we really had a chance to stop and, and share more than just a good time. We had a chance to really share our hearts. And I knew that at the root of all these things that we were doing, she still needed a job. <laughs> and she needed it really badly. <laughs> well, Kim is a master at play. She can make any child want to learn just by the sheer fun of it. I suspect you're much like that. And she works most often with disabled children. When the last school system that she had worked at, she'd worked her way up to department head, and she'd begun writing and publishing and, and training. But when she moved here to Virginia, it was like all of that kind of didn't matter. And so it's late August, and she still didn't have a job. <laughs> well, the call was good news. Now, one of those schools needed a preschool Head Start teacher, and she said, you know, it pays really not much, but I get to do what I love. I get to teach. In three days, she had her classroom set up, and she'd spent a lot of her own money, as many of our teachers do. You know that, don't you? Yeah. You know, they work really hard. Um, and she set up stations for her kids to, to learn, and then she began trying to get to know some of the other teachers. And she called after one particularly difficult day at, at work, and she said, they are so demoralized. She said the administration is demoralized. It was a Title I school. My guess is they didn't have an Amy Killian. Maybe they didn't have a, a staff like we're blessed to have over at Tyler, the school that we work with. She said there is no excitement around the school at all. The teachers don't work together. They just kind of each do their own thing. And I don't know what to do because school's getting ready to start. So being, my, being Kim, um, she tried taking in brownies and cakes and fudge because chocolate usually works, let's face it. Yeah. And she suggested, you know, maybe we should do a secret Santa for each other. She tried to get them interested in celebrating birthdays together. She said, I can't get them to do anything. So, <laughs> well, school started. And within the first few days, one of her kids had picked up chairs and thrown them, and she'd been hurt <laughs> trying to keep them from hurting the other children. Her assistant quit. Um, and one of the stations that she had so carefully put together had to be thrown out because it was infested with lice. So it turned out with she and everything else in the classroom. And two weeks later, everything had gotten worse. <laughs> they'd gotten rid of the lice, but they'd come back with a vengeance. And she'd gone to visit the families of her students, and she was even more discouraged. And she said, Debbie, they're, they're just trying to survive. They don't have any idea how to help their kids. And she said, I feel like we're their only hope. But it's, it's like we don't matter, like this part of the school doesn't matter. There's no funding. There's no resources. She said, the administration just seems like they're apathetic, uninterested in trying anything new. And worse, she said, it feels like one of those assistant principals just follows me around waiting to see if I'm going to do something wrong rather than improve the situation. You've lived in that place. And she said, I'm a good teacher. I don't understand. And she finished by saying, I don't want to hate my job. But... We prayed a lot together that year, and honestly, my prayer was more often than not, move her, Lord, give her a different job. Maybe you've been in that place, sounds like you have. Um, whether it's being under, underemployed, unappreciated, underpaid, overworked, or hopeless, maybe some of you are in that place now. What do you do when you feel like you're stuck in a job that you hate? Whew. Well, if you're in that place, you're probably not alone. According to Harris Interactive, about 55% of American workers want to change careers. Absolutely, they want nothing to do with this, whatever they've been working at. <laughs> that number goes up to 80% if you're between the ages of 20 and 30. That's kind of scary, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And Gallup polls report that about 50% of workers do not care about their jobs at all. They're just putting time in. Mm -hmm. And this should give you chills. Around 20% resent their job so much that they look for ways to sabotage it. Can you imagine? 
I'm grateful to work here. Thank you, Lord. And by the way, I do not hate my job. <laughs> just want to make sure you know that. <laughs> but if those numbers are accurate, um, based on these and other polls, actually only about a 30% of our population really enjoys their work. Yeah. And for a place that, that, honestly, we spend about a full third of our lives, those numbers are staggering. They're really pretty discouraging. There's got to be more to this work thing. So maybe we need to look at it differently. Um, we look at work through very human eyes. But I want us to look differently this morning. It's God himself who sets the standard as one who works. Genesis 1 describes his act of creating. At the conclusion of each day, he reexamined what he'd created, his work, and he pronounced it what? Good. Good. His work included bringing order and structure to that which was formless and void, fullness to that which was empty. And in John 5, 17, Jesus says that his father is always at work to this very day. And Jesus says, I too am working. And so work is a godly activity meant to be. And each day's work should bring us the joy of being able to pronounce it good. Should be able to pronounce it. You caught that, right? Okay. Genesis 2.15 tells us how we're related to that godly work. Um, the Lord God took the man whom he had created in his image. He put him in the Garden of Eden to do what? To, take care of it. to work. Yeah. To work and to take care of it. He put man there as his representative to continue the work that he had begun in bringing order to all of creation. And his direction to Adam and Eve was to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth, to subdue it. In other words, to bring his order to it. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. All right, the greatest joy about that work was that God did not leave man alone to do the job. Rather, man and God walked and talked every single day. So work in its conception is good, it's godly, it's for noble purpose, a purpose in which God is present with us and active. Now, some of you who know the scripture well are going to ask, well, didn't the fall of man change all that? <laughs> and Genesis 3, 17 through 19 does describe those effects. God says to Adam, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. Now, there's an encouraging statement, isn't it? Okay. Miroslav Wolf, who is a theologian, explains how that affected our work. Listen carefully, because he's a theologian, and some of the words he uses, I had to stop and look up. Um, he says, together, Genesis 2.15 and Genesis 3.17 affirm that the inescapable reality of human sin makes work unavoidably and ambiguous. I didn't know what that word meant. I had to go look it up. It means an unclear reality. So we have this thing that's supposed to be good, and, and we know instinctively that some of it's not. And he says it's both a noble expression of human creation in the image of God, and it's a painful testimony to human estrangement from God. It doesn't paint a very good picture, does it? I think he must have been Russian, because they have that. that <laughs> my son-in-law has that outlook. There's always that pessimistic side. Um, but you know, the good news is this: what changes that effect for us? Jesus Christ. He changes the whole thing. That's some really good news because when Christ came, he took all authority. Our work then is redeemed and reclaimed. Now this is going to take some thought on your part. On this side of the cross, what's our work now? Okay. <laughs> You're good. All right. In a sense, it is still to bring God's order and reign across the earth. That is not changed. Now we do it through making disciples, as you have said, of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That should sound familiar to you. Helping bring order and restoration to each life. Co-laboring with Jesus, as Paul writes, to bring order, peace, and structure of the kingdom of God, wherever we are including our work. Right? Okay. We pray that every time we pray the, the Lord's Prayer. Think about it. Your kingdom come, your order, your structure, your peace, your will be done on earth, wherever, even in our workplaces, as it is in heaven. And that's a lot to think about, isn't it? 
All right. Now, if you're not a Bible nerd, you have about 30 seconds to reflect on that while I talk to the Bible nerds among us. All right. Bible nerds, you might be interested to know that the term that we use as apostle in the church, meaning one who is sent, was actually used by the Greeks and Romans in a little bit different way. That term was in use during that same time period, and so we can help take that idea of what an apostle is and our understanding of what an apostle is from this understanding as well. Listen carefully. To them, an apostle was one who led a group in the assignment of bringing the culture of the victorious country to the country that had just been conquered. Think about that. The culture of the conquering country to the country that's been conquered. What did Jesus do? He took back authority on the earth. The conquering authority came to earth. And the reason they were to do so was so that the ruler would feel as much at home there as he did in his home country. Yeah. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's still our work then, isn't it? To bring God's order, his peace, and his structure. And so if you've zoned out, come back. Now some of you were going to say to me, I thought you were going to talk about my work. Well, I am. Because <laughs> we so often separate the work of God from our daily lives. We term some things sacred and some things secular as if what we do in here on Sunday morning has no bearing on what we do the rest of the week. Is that true? No. No, we are to live, as Romans 12 says, all of our lives as an offering to the Lord. And so everything about our lives then, is, including our work, is sacred, isn't it? I knew you knew that. Ecclesiastes 5.19 says that when God enables a man to be happy in his work, that this is a gift of God. I don't think he meant that just 30% of the population was to be happy. I really don't think that means that. So how can we be happy in our job, especially when we're underemployed, unappreciated, underpaid, overworked, hopeless, and so on? Colossians 3, 23 through 24 that you heard read a moment ago gives us a way to change our attitude, doesn't it? Whatever we do, we should do it for the glory of the one who made it, made us. Even if we don't like our job, but our very best effort working as if we are working for whom? God himself. Now the monetary rewards and the benefits of our job, both the ones we like and the ones we don't like, um, will all pass away one day. But this passage reminds us that in the meantime, we're not just working for earthly rewards, but rather we're working for eternal purposes, aren't we? God's reward, and those will never, ever pass away, will they? The second way is to remember our identity and calling our work as a people of God is to be at work at his representative wherever we are, continuing his work of bringing order and structure and peace to every sphere of influence. Now, does that mean promotion or a better job or better pay? Perhaps. Proverbs 22, 29 says that someone who is truly skilled in their work will serve before kings, not before lesser officials. But does that mean that the job is going to be all kinds of wonderful? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Think about Joseph, sold as a slave in Egypt. He's described as one who stewarded his master's wealth and his household as well. In fact, the scripture says that his master didn't have to worry about anything with Joseph in charge. What was Joseph's promotion? Prison. <laughs> but listen to the description of his work in prison. The warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care. He didn't have to, because Joseph worked with integrity wherever he was, bringing godly order, even recognized by those who were keeping him captive. Here's the best part, is Joseph did these things, first for his master, and then for the prison warden, the scripture says the Lord was with Joseph and he gave him success in whatever he did. Now you know how Joseph's story turns out. We might not end up being second in command, but how does that then apply to our lives? Well, there's always a way that we can help bring order, even if it's to a small bit of our work environment. We can choose to work with integrity, can't we? That way, when we look back at the end of the day, we can be happy with what has been done. And we, too, can say, it was good. It was good. And there's a further effect. I don't know how many of you read Bill Johnson. Sometimes he's way over my head, too. 
But he calls the communal result of doing those things a greenhouse effect, meaning that as we each live and work as God's representative, that it changes the very atmosphere around us. Would you like for the job, for the atmosphere around your job to change? Mm -hmm. Third, consider what God might want to do in that workplace. I don't know if this is God or this is Deborah, and I'll tell you this, but I've often wondered um, if God didn't entrust some of his most difficult workplaces to those that he could count on to truly labor for the master from the dawn to setting sun. Because if these passages are rightly interpreted, then we have a much higher calling than simply earning a living in a place that we're comfortable, don't we? Jesus says in Matthew 20, 26, that whoever would be great in the kingdom of God must become a servant to all. We often think of becoming a servant as a demeaning role, and yet Philippians 2 says that Christ himself took on the nature of a servant in order to fulfill the purposes and the plans of God. So as you consider that place where you're underemployed, underappreciated, it would be easy to see yourself as a victim, but what if you willingly chose, as Christ did, to take on the role of a servant in order to fulfill God's higher purposes in that workplace? Do you think it might make a difference? Finally, consider the accounting. In the parable of the talents, every servant of the master is called to account for how he or she has used the resources that she's been, or he has been given. So will ours. In the workplace, it's easy to focus on the skills and the talents we have. For the last several weeks, we've been talking about these other, the resources that we have within us, haven't we? The spiritual gifts. Could those be used in your workplace for a common good? You bet. How about the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. How might those things aid in your workplace? So you've been given skills and resources far greater than the norm, and we're going to be held accountable for how we use those. Would it be a good idea maybe to use those in the workplace? Ooh, I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant at the end of the day. How about you? Mm -hmm. That's a lot to think about, isn't it? Yeah. Let me tell you the rest of the story. After a year at that school, my sister got a new job in the best school district in the city. And she was so excited because they had so many resources. Their test scores were out of sight. And a few months into it, she was wondering if she had anything to offer that school. <laughs> now, she's not perpetually unhappy. I don't want to leave that, <laughs> that idea with you. <laughs> so a year later... She transferred again. You'll never guess where she transferred to. Back to that other school. <laughs> to that place where it was so difficult. But this is what happened. Every teacher that she had worked with talked about the difference that her presence had made that they recognized when she was gone. Even the administration that had seemed so apathetic was now open to new suggestions and ideas. So she began working with the teachers, helping them work together to create new learning opportunities in their classroom. They identified resources that the school couldn't afford to give, and they put those projects out on donors, too, so that those kids had what they needed, even though the school system couldn't afford it. And together, with the help of that assistant principal, who didn't like her very much, they worked to take a courtyard that had been long neglected and with their classes in a great new learning experience, they made it a place of beauty. By the time she and Jeff moved again, that school was an entirely different place. Is it always gonna turn out like that? Probably not. <laughs> and sometimes the godly option is to leave. We're going to be talking about how to discern those things over the next few weeks. But if we put those things into the practice, at the end of the day, we can look back at our work and we can pronounce it good no matter what's going on in the workplace, can't we? Amen. If we work with everything we have, we can know the pleasure of the Lord as we work with his attitude and purpose in mind, and we can experience the joy of his presence as he leads us. 
And who knows what else might happen? Because sometimes it just takes one. Amen? Amen. 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 <laughs>